class, so last time we left off with the game of ultimatum. And so what economic theory pretty much says is that if you can get a penny, you should take the deal. But most people won't, because again, it's this doctrine of fairness. So in the next step of this decision spectrum, we've talked about rationality, and now we're in the realm of bounded rationality. And that's that people are going to start to follow game theory and economic theory. The way we make decisions is based on our cognitive capacity, you know, how much information we can take in, what information we have actually available to us, and how much time do we have to make that decision. And what we find out, and this is the basis of that bounded rationality, is that people won't always make the rational decision. What they will do, though, is find, go for the first satisfactory outcome. Uh, one aspect of this is prospect theory. And what prospect theory is, is about gain and loss. And so here's the fundamental of prospect theory, and that's that people value loss two to two and a half times greater than they will value a gain. And so this is why entrepreneurs say, look for the pain. And the reason why is because we just value loss more. Uh, and this is why, well, people typically say it's 3x, they just round off. But a lot also depends on your reference point. Like, for example, if you're at the top of the curve here, then if I'm a multi-billionaire, I'm like Mark Cuban. And it's kind of funny because Cuban, uh, in his movie Sharknado, where he was president of the United States, they said, Mark, I need to get you to get mad. Imagine somebody lifted $500,000 out of your wallet. And Cuban said, if I have $500,000 missing, I wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> oh, that's a nice position to be in. Uh, but the point is, is it takes an awful lot of gain to bring any joy into their life. Now, on the other hand, if you're down here and you're a homeless person and you have no family, you're all alone in the world and you're sick, it really doesn't take very much <laughs> to make you gain something. And that's because you don't have much. And at the same time, though, uh, it's very difficult to cause you any more pain because you have absolutely nothing. So you also have to think about the position people are in. For example, if I'm selling a luxury product, guess what? I'm dealing with people up here. If, I'm deal if I have a product for third world country, my reference point is down here. Um, the thing about another part of game theory is reference points. That once we establish a point or a number, as irrational it might be, People go for it. For example, they had a big wheel of the numbers 1 to 100, and they spun it. And based on the number of the wheel, people thought that was the answer to the question. So they asked the people the question, what is the percentage of African nations in the UN? And so when the number 10 was spun, the average guess was 25%. But if the number 60 was spun, then the average went up to 45%. And the big thing about reference points is they're so powerful because they set perception. Examples of reference points you see. To buy an engagement ring, they say you have to pay a two-month salary. Who came up with this number? And what if you decide to pay less? Oh, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. Everybody's going to think you're a cheapskate. Your fiancé might get angry with you. But this is just some parameter set up by the jewelry industry. Another thing that's irrational is tipping. Okay, they tell you you should tip 15 to 20 percent. Well, if two people get served the same amount of time, but the cost of the meals are different, then in one case, if it's a $500 bill, that means for 30 minutes worth of work, they should get paid $100. If it's a $50 meal, then they should get paid $10. Same exact amount of work. Where's the rationality in this? But the thing is, reference points set where people are willing to pay. Uh, and an example is, uh, and then this is an example for you entrepreneurs, and that's that when you come out, so you come out with a totally new device, should you drop the price in the beginning to try to draw customers in, or should you keep it high? There's arguments on both sides. The problem is, is that whatever point you set, that's a reference point. If you set it too low, guess what? Customer 2 comes in. Hey, I heard customer 1 paid this point. And you want to sell it now all the way up here. Well, I'm not going to pay that. 
And now you're getting into the doctrine of fairness. He's thinking, you know, it's not fair. You're charging me more, but you let the first guy off. And that's why if you drop the price, you have to keep it contained. You can't, you have to say, oh, this is a special one-time offer, or, oh, actually, they didn't get the same product that you got or whatever, but you have to separate them. In general, when you come in high, it leaves you room to drop the price down. But when you come in low, you have a very tough time trying to get the price back up. Uh, framing. What framing is, is that you can have an outcome that can have exactly the same result. But depending on the way you tell it, people look at it differently. The simplest example of framing is the glass is half full. The glass is half empty. In the end, and this is why when Dr. Cho was asked that question, is are you a half full or half empty glass person? And my answer to that is, uh, neither. I'm a, there's four ounces in the glass person. <laughs> I'm just rational. It's like, this is reality. I don't put a value judgment on it of empty or full. But the point is, is you see how you present it that's perceived differently. And this is what framing is about. And so, for example, I give you $10,000. We're going to flip a coin. If it's heads, you get 20000 If it's tails, you get zero. Now, if I, and that's called a game frame. Now, if we present it as a loss frame, meaning 10,000 people are going to get laid off. Uh, we're going to put a new initiative together, and there's a 50% chance it works. If it works, no one will lose their job. If it fails, then we're going to lay off 20,000 people. More people are willing to take the second case than the first case. And it's because since we value losses so much greater than gains, we are willing to take a risk to get rid of loss. We're not willing to take a risk to get gain. We keep what we have. Um, and an example of pricing for products, for example, if I tell you this computer base price is $600, but I can reduce the price $100 if you don't want customer support. On the other hand, if I, uh, it costs $100 more for customer support. Or I can say this computer costs $700 for computer and support, or just $600 for just the computer. Well, those are two different ways of framing something. In one case, you're bringing in a higher number, and that's what you start to perceive. In the other case, you're bringing in a lower number. And so it's actually the 700 and 600 works better because you think, oh, I'm getting a bargain <laughs> if I just want the computer. In the other case, though, it's like, wait a minute, I'm going to have to pay even more? Uh, and so that's now another concept that comes into uh, framing is the magnitude of it. Let's play that game again, but instead of ten thousand dollars, it's a dollar. Well, a lot more of you are probably willing to pay because you're only risking a dollar. On the other hand, in the other case of the loss frame, if we're only talking about one person being laid off versus two, then you'd say, eh, just let the one guy go. And so the thing is, taking a risk or avoiding the risk also depends on the magnitude of stakes that we're playing. And so if you plotted it out in terms of reducing loss or getting gain, it all depends on small stakes or whether or not they're medium or big stakes. And this is the tendency people have. And so the way you can think about it is, depending on the pricing of my product, what are the odds that somebody's going to take it? Uh, chance on me. For example, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these because these videos are then going to turn into a full class, but if I have a new machine on using a new technology, and it's going to cost me $50 million, but has a potential to take 25% of my costs off, uh, I'm probably going to avoid it because, yes, I'm getting this gain, but I'm having to bet so much, it's like, mm, that's a little too risky for me. On the other hand, if somebody tells you, oh, there's a shooter app, and it's just absolutely amazing, and it's $2.99, so like, yeah, I'll try it. If it turns out to be a stupid game, eh, I lost $2.99. So you can see um, what the attitude is. And so what we see is, in terms of marketing, so we have this reference price effect, we have framing, and then we also have two other effects, which is mental accounting and status quo. Um, 
in terms of reference pricing, uh, common techniques that are used in marketing include uh, listing the price reductions, like you go into a discount place, you see the original price and the new price, say, wow, that's great. Uh, the thing is, price increases. Price out of the marketing mix is the most emotional parameter out of all the parameters. And therefore, even small effects have huge emotional impacts. And one is Netflix. When Netflix bumped up their price by $2 a month, they lost 800,000 subscribers. Uh, freemium, what do you do when you set the reference point at zero? <laughs> uh, and also, finally, to wrap it up, is rebates are really effective because uh, the thing is, people only redeem them at a 20 to 30% rate. So you make money. <laughs> uh, people like rebates. Uh, mental accounting is how do you account for the money that you have? How do people think about their money? Like if you if you paid six dollars, you're saying I'm going to stand a budget. I'm only going to spend six dollars a day uh, on uh, a lot, uh, coffee, and so you pay six dollars for your latte and you drop it. <laughs> it goes splat. Do you get a new one? You go to a coffee house and a wind kicks up and your six dollars blows out of your hand. You still get a latte. They're both losses. However, in the case of people dropping it, they tend not to get a new latte because they feel like the transaction was complete. Whereas if the money blows out of their hand, they'll say, oh, I'll pull my card out and get my latte because I really didn't get it. Uh, people do that level of uh, mental accounting. And the thing about status quo is that People typically don't want to make a change because it represents risk. And so there's a status quo, and that's the biggest problem with new products. That's what you're fighting against. And it's like, why should I go ahead and do this? And so there are exceptions to it where people will accept uh, change, and that's that, well, everybody else is doing it, so I guess it's okay. Um, and this is why we live in the age of influencer marketing. Uh, what are the worst groups to embrace change? Old people. They're set in their ways. They know what makes them happy. They don't want to do anything new. Uh, this is why only 50% of people over the age of 55 have a smartphone. They just don't see any need for it. And so subsequently, status quo is one of the biggest challenges for a startup. So the thing is, in terms of making decisions, what do people do? We recognize we have a problem, we look for solutions, we evaluate our options, we make a choice, and then based on the outcome, we feedback on how we're going to do it next time. And the thing is, the things that affect that are the perception of the benefits, uh, biasing my preferences, like framing things in a certain way, and how do I affect choice. And these are the things that marketing influences. And this is part of the reason why marketing works. Now, the last part of the decision spectrum is motivational, psychological theory. And what psychological theory is, people know, do, or feel. Meaning you think about it, you uh, create an action, you go ahead and do it. And then you think about how you feel about it. And essentially, people fall into categories of three different kinds of personalities. People who are utilitarian. They think about it, they think about how they feel, and then they act. These are the rational, logical types. Low involvement types are, you know, slugs. They just keep on doing it. So they know what they want to do, they do it. And then they think about how they feel about it later. And then the hedonistic people, these are the impulse buyers. They think about how they feel, they go ahead and do it, and then they think about, oh, how do I feel about it afterwards? Uh, an example of that are candy bars. Why do they put the candy by the register? Because if you logically thought about, why do I want a candy bar? You would talk yourself out of it. On the other hand, when you're by the cash register, what do they do? You don't have a lot of time to make a decision. So you just go on your gut and your feeling. And that's why they make it hedonistic. And so, depending on the persona of your customer, you look at which one matches your product, or you think about how are they probably 
want to act. Um, like the Donald Trump Chia Pet, <laughs> which is on uh, one of your cases. Naturally, those people are going to be hedonistic because nobody rationally would ever buy that. Uh, here are examples of other financial irrationalities. Uh, you could just read through those, like her behavior. Um, so the thing is, uh, what we've learned is a lot of different uh, behaviors. And each of these behaviors relates to how customers act. And what we're going to see as we go through this course is a lot of this stuff is going to pop up later.